Hey, happy Friday, and it's a happy one indeed, because the Neon's back. This week, Copilot 2.0 is coming to PCs, Epic is taking Samsung to court, and Samsung announced new things at their developer conference. Welcome to the Friday Checkout. This video was sponsored by Brilliant. Okay, for my first story of the week, a big new update for Copilot PCs is coming. New features that were announced include something called Click to Do that lets you press the Windows key and your mouse at the same time in any app for a context-aware AI menu. This is good for reverse image search and other AI stuff, obviously inspired by Google's very popular Circle to Search feature. Beside that, Windows Search will now let you search your files by describing what you mean in fuzzy language if you have an MPU, even when you're offline. Photos will now get built-in AI upscaling, image removal, and the usual AI features, and Recall is also officially relaunching on the 1st of November as well. Meanwhile, Copilot Vision will also analyze text and images on web pages that you browse in Edge and answer queries like, what's the recipe for food in this picture? And in addition, there's also something called Copilot Daily, which is a summary of news and weather read aloud, and meanwhile the Copilot app itself also got a pretty major redesign, plus an upgrade to what sounds like a custom version of OpenAI's O1 model and Copilot Voice. So that sounds like a pretty major overhaul, maybe something like a Copilot 2.0 moment, and it sounds like Microsoft also learned from its past and wants to avoid the disaster that was the recall launch and wants to do things more right this time. Copilot Vision, for example, will need extra explicit permissions to work, and they claim that it will immediately delete data following a conversation. Microsoft claims that they will pay publishers for using their content in Copilot daily, and meanwhile the AI built into Edge will not work if a site specifically blocks AI. We'll see how all these features turn out when they actually launch, but at least it seems like Microsoft is listening to some feedback. You will also need a Copilot Plus PC with a beefy NPU for some of these things that need on-device processing, but all the rest should come to all the PCs. Okay, and for my second story of the week, we have a brand new lawsuit from Epic, and I'm kind of conflicted on it. Specifically, Epic is suing Google and Samsung for a new auto-blocker feature in Samsung phones that will automatically block app installs unless they come from authorized sources like the Play Store or the Galaxy Store. Now, interestingly, the Samsung Galaxy App Store was one of the few places where Fortnite, the crown jewel of Epic, was available for most of the time when Epic was fighting Apple and Google, but now Epic has pulled the game from there in July in protest over the auto-blocker, so there's definitely some bad blood. Of course, Epic's Tim Sweeney says that the auto-blocker is purely designed to prevent competition, not to help keep users safe, as it increases the number of steps needed to download a third-party App Store to 21. And certainly the fact that Samsung added the blocker just a month before the Epic Game Store launched is kind of suspicious. Now Sweeney admits that he doesn't actually have proof of Google being involved here at all, but obviously Google does benefit a lot, so he just decided to sue both and see what happens during the legal proceedings. We have seen legal processes like these expose a ton of hidden data, so I guess that's not completely an unreasonable thing. And as for my personal opinion, while I do think that sideloading is important and should be allowed, I also think that most people have gotten used to the walled garden approach, and they do kind of need to see a bunch of warning signs before they leave the walled garden and just like download any random app from the internet without any kind of framework around this. They're just not used to this on phones. So I'm a little bit torn on all of this. What do you think? Okay, and for my third story of the week, Samsung had their big developer conference this week and they gave us an update on how all of their big software platforms are going. Sadly for phones, we only got a pretty vague mention of the Android 15 powered One UI 7, saying that it will go into preview this year, but will only launch next year with the Galaxy S25 series. They claimed that it will have brand new UX design that will be a major overhaul, but they didn't actually show any of it. I also think this means that Samsung phones will not get a stable version of Android 15 until next year, which would be uncharacteristically slow for Samsung, and so I really hope that this big update will be worth it. Anyway, moving on, a slightly unexpected update is that all Samsung software everywhere is supposed to use the One UI brand from 2025 on, meaning that not just phones, but also TVs, smart home, and more will be set to be running One UI. And the entirely expected update is that all Samsung wanted to talk about was AI. Bixby should let you use more natural language to talk to your home appliances, and your TV will, for example, get generative AI features like AI casting and ChatGPT for some reason. Meanwhile, my personal highlights were non-AI related, like for example the fact that Samsung said they are continuing to push RISC-V chips for Tizen development, saying that they can now run a web browser and a bunch of other apps on it. They said that Samsung Wallet will soon support opening smart home locks, and I 
IKEA smart home devices will now work with the Samsung ecosystem like SmartThings using Matter Bridge. They're apparently the first big platform to support Matter 1.3, for example. So yeah, nothing huge, but kind of nice. Okay, and starting our release monitor, Sony announced two new earbuds designed to stay put even during hard workouts. The Link Buds Fit and the Link Buds Open both cost $200, and they have a sort of tail for a secure fit with updated sound, plus there's also a new Link Buds portable wireless speaker. Next, Aura announced the Ring 4, which is lighter, has more sizes, is made fully of titanium, has an extra day of battery life, and also drops the nobles from the previous generation. Of course, they claim that the sensors and the algorithms are better too, though the price went up by $50, now up to $350, and it still comes with a $6 monthly subscription. Fun fact, the Aura CEO said the Galaxy Ring was aiming where we were two years ago, though I bet Samsung would disagree with that. Moving on, Amazon launched a bunch of new tablets like the Fire HD 8, the Fire HD 8 Kids, and the Fire HD 8 Kids Pro, which is still dirt cheap and come with the usual spec bumps and a bunch of color options, plus, of course, new AI features. What else? And talking of AI, the bike equipment maker Shimano announced plans to launch an AI-powered gear shifting system next year. AI-powered gear shifters? We're truly entering the weird era. Anyway, they claim that this should assist cyclists with apparently improving electronic shifters. AI everything, I guess. And meanwhile, our last release is that Microsoft has announced Office 2024, which should make people happy who don't like subscriptions. It costs $150 outright or $250 if you also want Outlook. Okay, and as for a brief, we'll start with some rumors for Apple. The iPhone SE will apparently be majorly overhauled with Face ID, Apple Intelligence via a possible A18 chip on board, and even an OLED display finally getting rid of the hilarious bezels. There'll still just be one camera, but that sounds like a pretty major jump. And meanwhile, there are also rumors for a new iPad mini later this year, along with a revamped tiny Mac mini and new MacBooks with M4 chips. Meanwhile, also this week, YouTube announced a whole bunch of updates for short, including that you'll be able to ask YouTube to show you fewer of them. Hallelujah. And they also said that shorts will now be allowed to be up to three minutes long, which is up from 60 seconds. Given that TikToks can now be basically arbitrarily long, I bet that that's where YouTube is going to. And if they are, I wonder if they'll have to rename shorts to something else, because like long shorts kind of doesn't make sense. And moving on, this week OpenAI also did the largest ever venture capital funding of all time, finally raising a long rumored $6.6 .6 billion, valuing the company at $157 billion. Interestingly, the funds are reportedly contingent on OpenAI becoming a for-profit company within two years, which they have been trending towards for a while now. And talking of AI, California's governor Gavin Newsom vetoed his state's big AI safety bill. He claimed that it was too broad and yet it still only targeted big AI efforts, not small ones, among many other complaints. Oh well. And next, Microsoft has officially discontinued its HoloLens headsets. Like, completely, with no replacement in sight. Support for the HoloLens 2, including security updates, will end on the 31st of December 2027, and the company also nuked its so-called Windows Mixed Reality platform effective almost immediately. It's kind of strange to see Microsoft retreating completely from VR and AR when they had such a big lead, especially in AR, for example, and especially when companies like Meta and Apple are pushing more towards it. And in more news proving that we can't have nice things, Amazon apparently plans to increase the number of ads on Prime Video in 2025 after not seeing a sharp drop in subscribers since adding advertisements in January 2024. Thanks, I hate it. And meanwhile, do you remember this image that was generated by an AI system called Midjourney that won an art competition? In ironic news, its creator is now complaining that he's losing millions of dollars from people stealing what he considers to be his work. He claims that the copyright office is refusing to register it and others are selling it as prints or as crypto, for example. Oh, the irony. I am truly shedding a tear for him. Jokes aside though, with AI dominating so much of the conversation in 2024, it's a really good time to learn how these technologies like large language models actually work. And Brilliant has fantastic courses on exactly this, like this one called How LLMs Work. I've even used this very course and another one called Neural Networks for research for a few of my videos. Brilliant is a fantastic online learning community designed to help you learn STEM skills. This includes not just computer science topics, but also those around maths, physics, engineering, and more, so you can get a complete picture and learn to think like an engineer. 
The specialty of Brilliant is that all of their courses are designed from the ground up with interactivity in mind, so they break complicated topics into smaller chunks, which you can then practice right away. Not only is this proven to be more effective at making you actually remember what you've just learned, it's also just way more fun than simply passively consuming information, so you're also more likely to stick with it. To try everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org TFC or click on the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription if you choose to get one. Happy learning and I'll see you next Friday.